Do you want to be successful? Do you want to keep the school of hard knocks away from your CV? Have a seat then. Today we have a story about two similar people, one of whom lost everything, and the other built a financial empire on his mistakes. Thus began the story of Buick, the company that made the cars from GTA. Rockstar was really inspired by these cars. The Ballas Gang from San Andreas drove their copies. In reality, Buick competed with Ford and occupied the US with China. Do you smell success? But first things first. Buick's story begins in the 19th, yes, the 19th century. It was in Scotland. The country was peasant and poor. Everybody lived mostly in dugouts, ate potatoes, and could barely make ends meet. The Scots had not had enough of war. In 1945, the villagers noticed that their potatoes stopped growing. It turned out that a fungus had eaten them up, so the era of famine began. And what about our hero? His name was David Buick. He was born in the harbor industrial area, among the docks and the workmen's swear words. There was always work to serve the ships. David's father was a carpenter. Nothing is known about his mother. David was a clever and inventive young man, but in times of famine, there was little room for apprenticeship. You had to survive. One day, David's father slammed his fist on the table and said, We're tired of living from scrap to scrap, tired of living among drunkards and beggars. We're going to the United States to make a better life for ourselves. Little David didn't mind. He was only two years old. The Buicks sailed across the Atlantic and settled in Detroit. The U.S. wasn't much friendlier. Many Scots were beaten because of their religion. Riots were committed on Irish neighborhoods. All in all, crime, from which Irish gangs began to crawl. On top of that, there was hunger and poverty. Most immigrants lived in abandoned apartments, basements, and attics. Some lived in sewers. Apart from that, the newcomers didn't know the language, and some employers took advantage of that, first hiring the immigrants and then kicking them out without pay, of course. The immigrants weren't satisfied with that. They drank, but there was nothing they could do. It was either kill or be killed. So much for the USA. History is silent on whether David had any of this darkness. We only know that his father died early, and the care of the family fell on the shoulders of Buick Jr. He delivered newspapers, drove goods around the city, and in general, as much as he could, supported the family, and at the same time studied at school. But now David is known not because he's David, and not because he's Buick. Since childhood, the boy was inventive. Ideas came to him, but he couldn't make them come true. David's hormones were playing up. David was tired of being in the shadows. He was 15 years old and he hadn't done anything great yet. With those thoughts in mind, the boy quickly left school and got a job at a plumbing factory which immediately recognized his talent. At first, David was hired as a mechanic. A year later, he was promoted to foreman. Twelve years later, Mr. Buick was the head of the company, majestically sporting a mustache. David simply took a friend and made his way to the top. There's a little secret to this story, though. How did David manage to win such positions? How did he go from ratty holds to spacious offices with leather chairs and lacquered telephones? As has been said, David was an inventor. He invented irrigation systems, enameled tubs, and even a toilet flush design. Be proud, folks. Now you know the name of the man who got your creations disposed from the toilet bowl. It would seem there is nothing special about David's creations, but every one of his inventions is still in use today. Let's return to our muttons. At 32, David had a steady income. He had 13 patents in his pockets for his inventions. 13, not a bad number, but it brought David to ruins. David may have had ADHD, a syndrome where you can't concentrate on something and constantly jump from one idea to another. So did our hero. 
he decided it was time for him to make cars. In 1903, he designed this old girl. A beauty, no kidding. Buick invented an engine for it, compact and powerful, with holes where it was needed. Now the whole world drives such engines because their stuffing is simple and universal, like a Swiss watch. That's a great plan. Walter, that's fucking ingenious if I understand it correctly. It's a Swiss fucking wad. The business of the company, however, failed. Buick spent all the dough on the car, which, by the way, was given to a neighbor for only $300. No money, no workers either. On top of that, David had a huge loan putting pressure on him. Yes, it cost money to start your motor company, too. That seemed to be it. The company was ruined. But Buick was not an easy one. He decided to give the wheel to a more experienced manager, the person who would lead the firm to prosperity. The candidate he was looking for quickly sailed into his hands. What David didn't know, though, was that he was going to be his own downfall. Bill Durant. That was the name of the enterprising American who raised the company from its knees. Bill, just like David, dropped out of school and went to work. But Durant Jr. had powerful parents who taught him how to make a buck from a dime. At first, Bill slaved in a sawmill. Then he got a job as a cigar salesman. At 24, Billy made his first company, where $2,000 startup money grew to $2 million. Durant was enterprising, goal-oriented, and prudent. But he was terrified of cars. It was a long time before Bill got the hang of the auto industry. He had previously kept his daughter away from cars, but his encounter with David changed him. He just put Bill in the car and said, drive. After excuses and bickering, Durant pressed the pedal. The same day he agreed to run the company and began repairing the Buick Motor Company. Durant, in fact, got nothing. There was no reputation, no fame. There was only one car that Bill took to the New York show. The decision played out. Durant came back with orders for a thousand cars, worth considering that Buick had only produced 37 before that. The company was slowly growing. It took four years and the Buick cars have become the best selling. On top of that, Durant merged with other auto giants altogether. Thus, the General Motors Association was formed, about which we're going to… Oh, that's right, we aren't. There's already a video about that on the channel. Go ahead, click it. We don't teach you business for nothing. David's business got worse day by day as he managed to fall out with Durant, who was firmly in power. We don't know exactly how Buick got kicked off the board. Perhaps he was hoping for his piece of the company, but Durant bought it out too. David, though, got $100,000 and he subsequently went bankrupt. Buick first invested money in oil. Then he decided to assemble carburetors. Neither of these or any other undertakings brought success. The aging David went completely broke and worked as an instructor at a craft school. Sometimes he didn't even have enough for food. In 1928, the 73-year-old Buick was interviewed. He said he had no regrets, and the next year, he died of cancer, leaving the engines running without their creator. Durant, on the other hand, seemed to be thriving. He attracted big names to his company. Cadillac, Oldsmobile, Oakland, Elmore. In addition, Bill bought auto repair shops, who would supply him with parts on the sly. It seemed to be a success. The business wouldn't go bust. If one company went under, others would rehabilitate it right away. But Durant had a lot of jealousies. They wanted him out of office. And where Ford cars started selling better, Bill was made the scapegoat. That's life, folks. The company kicked out its breadwinner. The hell with you, Durant said. He didn't ask for handouts from those who betrayed him. Instead, he stopped by to see Louis Chevrolet for a cup of tea, and during that tea, started a new firm with him. Louis was an experienced American racing driver. He worked first with Fiat, and then he got involved with Buick. That's where he met Durant. They hit it off, 
and when the director was replaced, the racer went with his employer. Bill and Lewis organized the company. They called it Chevrolet and attracted Durant's son-in-law to finance. The Chevrolet Classic 6 gangster cars rolled off the assembly line. An expensive luxury car, folding top, windshield. This beauty was selling well in the USA, being in demand abroad as well. Bill began to think about getting his company back. Soon, he had his chance. He and the Chevrolet had saved enough dough. He began to have creative differences with the car racer, and Lewis slammed the door, selling the company to Durant. Now Billy had money, just like Billy Bones in Treasure Island. The treasure, by the way, was not long in coming. In 1915, William Durant bought out his former automobile company, not forgetting to let the traders fuck themselves. Cars again. Luck again. In addition, Billy also took over Chevrolet. That is, he beat everyone he could. What about the cars? Don't worry. There'll be transmissions, suspensions, and other stuff. The average viewer will also understand everything. After all, we have a business lesson. Let's start with the Buick F. This carriage was assembled three years after David left. But what would happen if you put a tarp over it? Voila! We've got a Buick 25, a gangster car that may have been driven by noodles from once upon a time in America. Great movie, by the way. The Buicks were the first to think of putting a roof over cars. If they hadn't, who knows how long it would have taken for the driver to catch colds and swallow aspirin. And in 1934 came out with this sweetie, where in addition to in it was a new engine. The car drove smoothly and comfortably with it. Oh, a dream, trading my wife for a car. The continuation of the line was the Buick Roadmaster. There were models with a roof, without a roof, with a long and a short muzzle. In general, Bill Durant liked variety, and on this ground he had split with Henry Ford. Enemies were everywhere, including behind Bill's back. Durant's colleagues didn't like his methods. You see, Bill designed all sorts of models so that everyone could find a car to their liking. Colleagues, on the other hand, felt that there was no need to spend too much. You could just pour a little money into your pocket, but that's my speculation. Fortunately for his enemies, Bill decided to leave. He was captivated by the Wall Street game of stock trading. It was almost a casino. The chart went up, the chart went down. Buy, sell, buy, sell. Blinded by the seemingly easy profits, Bill wasted his money and went broke. In 1936, he declared bankruptcy, and six years later, he had a stroke. His health was deteriorating. Bill grew weaker by the day. He died in 1947. Apparently, the fate of David Buick, who also died of lack of money and illness, was a hit. Bill, however, lived out his days on handouts from friends. Buick didn't have that, but he didn't complain about his fate either. But the power struggle was a sneaky one. Who poured their money into cars? Bill Durant, who's been selling 800 times more in five years? Bill Durant, who took the lead in the market? Who upgraded the engines? Who made $60 million for the company? Bill goddamn Durant. The employees once decided to change the name of the company to Durant because it sounded better. Bill just brushed it off. He thought his last name was hard to hear, which is a serious problem for attracting new profits. So Buick evolved. A quick paint system appeared. In the old days, it took a month to do it. And in the 40s, it took six hours. Buicks were the first to put on turn signals. Many competitors reached this stage decades later, and BMW is still mastering this technology. By the way, do you want a design trick? Many Buicks had airplane turbines in the back. It was after World War II, and fighter cars were liked by both servicemen and teenagers. 
Eventually, the turbines lasted on the cars for 45 years. Everyone dreamed of flying an airplane, and those who paid were successful. So what's coming out? Buick is a brand that has transcended reality. Even the creators of Need for Speed paid the money and put the GNX in their game. And the Riviera was driven by Jason Statham, Nicolas Cage. It was even featured in Back to the Future. Buick played FBI cars. And film companies have to pay money for the copyright. Otherwise, they'll be sued, and there's no one to judge. So what is the reality? Buick was the market leader until the 2000s. Its tentacles reached even the totalitarian USSR. And in China, it was the most popular brand. Many Chinese guys gave up a bowl of rice to save money for a compact Regal. But in 2008, things took a turn for the worse. Companies went into a crisis. Even Ford and Chrysler were caught up in it. Money quickly ran out, and the Buicks asked for help from George Bush himself. Old George was expected to chip in a little money. The president helped, of course, but not with money, but with a huge loan that made the whole company poor. 20,000 office workers were out on the street. As to the government, it quickly ate up General Motors, having presented a small piece to Canada. That's the moral of the fable. Guys, spend money on coffee, on sodas, on donuts at the local diner. Keep the money down, sell the house, but don't betray it. That's the forbidden rule of business. Durant fired Buick from the firm and went broke himself. Two identical fates, two identical ups and downs. In order not to repeat their mistakes, please, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to pet the nearest doggy. Without that, our team will not release a new video. See you later, young businessmen. I'm gonna invest in McDonald's. Well, let's get some fries.